years back when John Swat was teaching a meditation retreat at IMS. Toward the end of the retreat, there was a Q&A session where one of the questions was, how do you take the meditation into daily life? And his answer was to focus on the five precepts. A lot of people misunderstood his answer. They interpreted it as his being dismissive of lay people, that lay people really couldn't or shouldn't focus on meditation in daily life and they should just stick to the lowly practice of the precepts. But that wasn't his point. His point was that following the precepts is an important part of meditation. Taking on a precept, taking on all five of the precepts, teaches you very important lessons and develops very important skills, all of which are integral to meditation. One thing, it focuses your attention on your intentions. Because you can break the precept only intentionally. And so it forces you to ask yourself, what are your intentions? Why do you act? What's the motive behind your actions and your choices? one of the few intentions that really is worth sticking with all the time is the intention to be harmless. So this is why you decide that you don't want to kill, you don't want to steal, you don't want to have illicit sex, you don't want to lie or take intoxicants, because all these actions are harmful by their nature. So you set up that intention. And then you try to stick by it. This requires mindfulness and it requires alertness, which are imp also important factors in the meditation. You have to keep your precepts in mind and you have to watch over your actions. To make sure that they don't get it, go against your original intention. And you can see the parallels with meditation. You set up your intention, you're going to stay with the breath. You have to be mindful and alert to make sure you actually do stay with the breath and don't go wandering off. So this is how the precepts are like meditation in daily life. They take your actions as your objects. And you develop all the skills that you need in meditation. And the precepts also remind you of the power of your intentions. Once you stick by an intention, you'll find it really does change your life. It creates a better atmosphere for your meditating. You stick with that intention not to be harmful. And when the time comes to actually sit down and do the meditation, or to try to be mindful in other ways throughout the day, it's a lot easier. You don't have a lot of remorse over the things you've done or said that were harmful. You don't have to go into denial about what you did. It creates a much better atmosphere, a much better environment. So it's a lot easier for the mind to settle down and be at ease with itself. But the precepts also teach you important lessons about Sangwega. Because you begin to notice, as you try to maintain that intention not to be harmful, how really difficult it is. Because life maintains itself by feeding. If there ever a good argument against intelligent design, this is, this is a good one. Why is it that we have to feed off each other all the time? Wouldn't it be better if we could feed off 
inanimate objects, if we could eat rocks, if we could eat soil, nothing would be harmed. And there are limitations to the precepts. You decide that, like the, for example, the precept against killing. Is basically, you're not going to kill yourself and you're not going to give the explicit order to anybody else, or even an indirect hint to anyone else that they should kill. You do it then. It's difficult to go through life without somebody getting killed. In the process just of living. You walk across the, the sidewalk. You know how many things you step on. Or the eating you do. Even if you decide to be a strict vegetarian, there's still a lot of insects that get killed in the process of farming. So as you reflect on your precepts and reflect on your desire to be harmless, it creates a good strong sense of sanguega which is an important element of discernment, to remind you that it would really be good to get out of this whole process, to find a happiness that doesn't need to feed. Maybe there is something to this nirvana business after all that really would be something good. So the precepts not only help develop the skills you need for concentration, but they also provide a context for gaining discernment gaining insight. As for the eight precepts, those move on into another area of training for the mind. Again, John Sawat, the eight precepts add the element of restraint of the senses. Each of those added precepts deals with one or another the types of pleasure that we try to get through the sense doors. The precept against illicit sex turns into a precept against sex, period. Then there's a precept against eating after noon or before dawn. Precept against watching shows, listening to music. Using perfumes and scents. And then the precept against high and luxurious beds and seats. You go down the list and you can see that each of the six senses, or excuse me, each of the five senses is taken care of here. This adds a higher level of restraint and also places some barriers on our typical ways of indulging, our desire for pleasure. Evening munchies, and the desire for a nice, thick mattress to lie on. Wanting to smell nice, liking to listen to music. By taking on these precepts, you learn to put some barriers around your self indulgence that serves several purposes. One, it focuses you on the meditation. If you're going to find any pleasure in the day, you have to look more intently at developing pleasure in the meditation. make up for the restrictions you have on the outside. But also it teaches you important lessons on this whole question of indulgence. If you tend to be very indulgent in your daily life, you're going to find yourself very self-indulgent when you meditate. If you can't say no to your daily desires, then it's going to be hard to say no to them while you're sitting here and meditating. The mind states want to go off and think about pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. They're very easy to indulge in if you don't have the habit of saying no to yourself. You develop that habit and you find that it's a lot easier in the course of the meditation. And then as you begin to develop that sense of pleasure that comes with the concentration, 
you've also developed the habit of learning when to say enough. Okay, enough of just indulging the pleasure and realizing there's also work to be done here. You really got to learn how to understand what's going on in the mind, why it creates these worlds to begin with, the worlds that pull you away from the present moment. So the precepts are a very important part of meditation. They develop good habits, and they also lead to insight. You begin to see, especially this question of being self-indulgent, there are a lot of pleasures we indulge in that really do get in the way of deeper pleasure, deeper happiness. We all want our cake and to have our cake and to eat it too. We want to play chess and keep all our pieces and win at the same time. And it's an important lesson to realize that there are certain pleasures that really get in the way of higher happiness. You've got to learn how to say no. And you have to develop a sense of moderation. How much pleasure is enough? For you to do, for you to do the real work at hand. So learn to look at the, the precepts as an important part of the meditation. They're not Sunday school rules. Or conventional truths that someone who hits the more ultimate truths will eventually say no to and will flout with impunity. They're an important part of training the mind. in all the skills, skills and concentration, skills and discernment, that ultimately lead to release. So when John Sawat was asked about how to bring the meditation into daily life, he was not dismissing lay life at all. He was pointing to an important fact. This is how you meditate in daily life. is by being very careful about your precepts, respecting them, and being alive to look at the lessons that they teach.